Thank you everyone for being on time. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Sierra Lau and welcome to our webinar on substance use in adoles adolescence, identifying disorder and treatment options. Um, this is the second webinar in a five part series on youth and substance use prevention. Uh, we'd just like to take a moment to thank our funders, California Youth Opioid Response for supporting this project. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted on our website as well as sent to all uh, registrants for the webinar. And we're going to answer questions throughout the webinar. So feel free to chat them. We'll also have time at the end. So go ahead and put in your questions as they come up. A little information about the California School-Based Health Alliance for a statewide nonprofit dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Oh, give me one second. Um, sorry, I just got a notification that the slides aren't forwarding. Give me one second. We can switch to one of us sharing as well, if that would help. I'll just start from the beginning. Let me sure, try one more time. What side are you seeing right now? The putting healthcare in schools? No, substance the side. Nothing. Huh. Sierra, do you want me to share or not? You can just tell me to push through. Okay, sure. That'd be great. Thanks, Amy. So if you just stop sharing, I will share. Yeah, sorry about that. There we go. And then you can cut down to slide four. Okay. Thanks everyone for your patience. We're a little bit doomed here at the moment, aren't we? <laughs> It'll all work out. Okay. okay, yes. This one, perfect. Oh, okay. one, well, you can go one more forward, please. Great, thank you. Um, so here's our website. You can learn a little bit more about us. We, uh, great, can, everyone can see now. Um, we can, we go ahead and support school-based health centers through two main ways. We advocate for more school-based health centers as well as support those that are, uh, that are already existing. Uh, you know, we do this through a, a variety of ways, policy, capacity building, technical assistance, like today's webinar. Um, and actually, we also do it through our conference, which is the next slide. On Friday, April 29th, we are having, as of now, an in-person conference in the Redlands in San Bernardino. So we hope you all can join us. Um, Amy, next slide. Thank you so much. If you are not already, we encourage you to become a member. You get a big discount on conference, which makes membership well worthwhile and you also get uh, technical assistance tailored to your organization's needs. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and sign up at that uh, link right there on the bottom. And next slide, Amy. And so without further ado, I would like to present our two speakers today. Uh, we have Dr. Amy Mullen is an assist associate professor at UC Davis with a dual appointment in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Psychiatry. Dr. Mullen is a co-investigator of the California Bridge Project dedicated to advancing 24-7 high quality access to treatment for people with substance use disorders. She is past president of the California American College, College of Emergency Physicians, during which she advocated to expand access to care for people with mental illness and substance use disorders and secured support for ED-based peer substance use navigators. Dr. Mullen completed a fellowship in quality safety and comparative effectiveness with, uh, sorry, through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality with a focus on acute care for patients with mental illness. And then we also have Elizabeth Keating joining us. She leads the training and technical assistance strategy to ensure successful implementation for all hospitals supported by California Bridge. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Amy and she will get us started. Thank you and um, um, really thank you everyone for being here. We're going to talk today about um, drugs and adolescence. And really what I want this to do is 
kind of come together and ideally you walk away from this with a better understanding of treatment options and to think about this um, really as a medical illness that is treatable. And that's gonna be the underlying message. So if you take nothing away, that's all I want you to learn from this and um, we're gonna push through. So this is just um, California Bridges with the Public Health Institute. This is our disclosure slide. Um, and this is really where I wanna go. And that is, you know, in terms of schools and healthcare providers, I'm an emergency physician. I just wanna take a moment to thank you all for being here. And to thank you for everything that you bring because you know we've all been through a lot. Um, and so I just understand like the challenges that we have been through and the challenges that we face in the future to kind of just recognize like we've had a lot of work ahead of us and we have been through a lot. So just to take a moment to um, appreciate yourself and the work that you do and appreciate the resilience that you have brought to your work to get yourself to this point. And going forward, taking the compassion um, and remembering that to bring that compassion to young people because we really have this huge opportunity to really impact young people and their lives and their futures. So um, just wanna say like, I want to begin this with kindness and respect for all of us who've been through a lot and have a lot ahead of us. So thank you. Okay, so here's where we're going. Also just wanted to reiterate, I love questions. So please interrupt, please put stuff in the chat. Um, we wanna hear from you and would love to hear what your thoughts are. And if there's something you have questions about, if something just doesn't feel right to you, please jump up, interrupt me, would love to hear from you. So this is what we're gonna talk about. Addiction is fatal. Um, addiction is also treatable. And so to walk away from knowing that addiction is a life-threatening emergency um, and there should be some urgency to recognizing and offering treatments because there's really a lot that we can all do to help. So this is the, the records from last year. Um, this was a story in the New York Times that came out this fall that more than 100,000 Americans had died from drug overdoses in the past year. And I know in the context of COVID, we've kind of gotten numb to death, but the people who die from overdose are, um, these are preventable deaths. And this last year, more people died from car accidents than guns combined. And overdose deaths have doubled since 2015. And the sad thing for me is I have slides from 2015 talking about the tragedy of 40,000 deaths and we've met and exceeded that number. Um, and if you look at where deaths are increasing the most, used to be 10 years ago, this was a East Coast um, an Appalachia disease. But if you look now across the map where overdose are increasing at the fastest rate is in California. Um, that really we are seeing and, and we are the state that is driving the numbers currently. Um, so this is something that is really prescient in all of our communities. And I wanna take a little bit of a moment because what we're talking about is adolescence. And I think that you know when we talk about adolescent use, we have this, this sort of disconnect um, because when we think about someone who's using heroin, we have this vision in our minds about um, someone who is unstably housed, injecting heroin on the streets. They're usually middle-aged. They're certainly not a teenager on the high school basketball team. Um, and so we just have this disconnect, partially because the way adolescents use um, but I kind of want to break down and think about like, hey, this is something that we all face um, and that it is all that we need to kind of recognize and offer that open door. And by kind of denying that someone might have a problem, we're unable to help. So the first step is to maybe acknowledge that there's, there's a problem, there's something we can do. So this is kind of talking about how adolescent use differs. But this is um, from the National Survey on Drug Use. One in seven students reported misusing prescription opioids. They feel safer to people. One in 14 reported misusing them in the past 30 days. 
One in five 12th grade graders reported using prescription medicine without a prescription. Um, and one in seven students reported ever trying cocaine inhalants, heroin, meth, hallucinogens, or ecstasy. And this is old data from, this is from 2019. And what we are seeing on the ground from our hospitals is really the ease of obtaining non-prescription opioids off the internet has exploded. Um, and so I think that we are, again, this is an uh, undercount from where we are at this moment. We see different patterns of use. Um, we see a lot of experimentation, recreational, social use, that often then what will happen, particularly with opioids, people will use on the weekends, and then the weekend will bleed into Monday and Friday, and then you start to have some of those negative consequences around um, missed school. People will start to have withdrawal symptoms. So then they will need to use so that they don't experience withdrawal. And then you start to get into that pattern where you need to use just to feel normal and get through your day. Um, but you definitely kind of see that period of dependence, abuse, and then you start to get into addiction where we see all those negative consequences on our life physical dependence, and then physiological dependence. And in adolescence, I'm hoping what we bring from this when we start to talk about the physiology of adolescence is that any use in adolescence can be a problem. And so we all need to kind of recognize like there's an opportunity to intervene. Um, this is also data that I wanted to show that looks at intentional and suspected suicide cases. And this is poison center data. And I think that this will probably ring true for you and your population that looks at intentional overdoses um, by age and gender. So these are for teenagers and children ages eight to 18. And you can see we've seen a drastic rise in about 2014, 2015 in intentional overdoses. Um, the green number is total. The pink is girls and the blue is boys. And so you can see the spike has really been in young women in terms of intentional overdose deaths, intentional overdose attempts. Okay, so why is the adolescent brain so susceptible? Um, this is something like if you think about and you think about your population, frontal lobe development does not occur until 26. And what the frontal lobe is, that's the part of your brain that helps you to kind of weigh the risk benefit of the any decision. It's the one that says like, hey, do I really wanna jump off a cliff because this could be dangerous for me. That doesn't really happen until 26. So what we kind of know um, and what we've learned from neurodevelopment is your just brain isn't able to make those really good decisions about a risk benefit of any activity until 26. So they kind of have that, um, we call it disinhibition, but it's really just that frontal lobe isn't fully developed. Um, so you're just not able to make really good decisions till 26. Also, adolescents have less dopamine. Dopamine is the substance that kind of makes your brain feel happy and well. It's the substance that you um, is released in your brain when you feel happy, contented, and well. Adolescents just have less of it at baseline. So when you see them walking around kind of grumpy, it's because they're, they're kind of dopamine depleted. And the way that they get more dopamine is often in that sort of risk reward um, where certain activities will, will kind of have that higher, higher dopamine release. And so a lot of that risk taking and that risk reward behavior will increase their dopamine levels. Um, and so that's why you often see a lot more risk taking behavior in adolescents. And just to kind of recognize like, you know, it is normal and it is needed for healthy brain development. So it is just a part of our development, but it does put them at higher risk for some of these risky activities like substance use. And so what we land on is substance use disorders really begin in adolescence um, and that treatment doesn't usually begin until adulthood. And so we have this real disconnect um, this is the age of first use, which is around 17, and the age of treatment, which is around 26. And so we have this lost decade, and it's a really important formative decade um, where we need to do a better job of identifying and recognizing potential for use and getting people into treatment. 
Um, this is another statistic from the National Survey on Drug Use, which is only 10% of children ages 12 to 17 who need substance use treatment actually receive services. Part of this is on me. Um, as physicians in the community, we too have a hard time recognizing substance use disorders in adolescents and really want to feel like they're able to, um, it's something they're gonna grow out of. But what we know about brain development and what we know about um, the way that they develop, that's just not true. So again, this is another one looking at the age of initiation and to see that really substance use initiation starts in those critical years um, under 18 and certainly less than 24. Again, frontal lobe development at 26, so you start to make good decisions after that brain is developed and we see less initiation of substance use. Any questions? I'm gonna pause for a moment here if anyone has any questions or thoughts. I mean, we've got a couple of good questions. We have Tracy who asked our favorite question. It's almost like she's been in our brains. She says, do we know why female teenagers and children are more likely to commit suicide through intentional overdose? We didn't even show her that data. Are you following us around, Tracy? I know. So it's just really interesting the um, the gender discrepancies around intentional overdose attempts between um, young women and young males. It's just really stark. And I think that this is something that um, our group is really committed to digging into. Um, there's a lot of theories out there in terms of the negative impacts of social media on young females. Um, but I think that this is, it's, you know, it's the first piece, and this is something you're going to take away is to recognize that there is a problem because we can't help if we don't recognize there's a problem. So, um, while I don't have all the answers, I do know that we need to pay extra attention, particularly to our adolescent females, because they're at increased and increasing risk is what the data is showing us. Yeah, and a little bit later in the presentation, I'll talk about the formal project that we're doing to increase this treatment and how we're thinking about the gender discrepancies in these trends. So Tracy, thanks for that question. Um, a couple more questions, Amy. Melissa Wilkins wants to know this slide, that, um, the slide before yours, uh, age of initiation, just one slide earlier. Mm -hmm. Is this age of initiation of those in treatment? This is the age that they initiated treatment. Is that correct? Correct. So this is a study. Um, they looked at people who were in treatment for substance use and asked, when did you start? Um, and so that's why, you know, when you actually look back and see someone who has had those negative consequences, who has developed a substance use and is now in treatment, looking back to when did you start? Um, and usually we see there's at least a decade before someone begins to enter treatment. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Suzette is saying um, we also need to be thinking about gender expansive youth, which, yes, we could do an entire second webinar about the gender um, and, and non-conforming uh, trends that we're seeing in this and the fact that we have almost no data about that gender expansive category. So Sierra, let us know if you want us to come back and do that webinar. It would be a lot more pontificating, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. To clarify the data on the Poison Center on gender was um, self-reported gender. Yep, yep. So um, we have, um, James Krauss is asking how many adolescents who experiment will go on to have a disorder. Do we know that? We do not, we, so we still do not know that answer. Um, we also do not have well-defined pathways to understand, you know, what are, to be able to identify who is going to go on to develop a disorder, even adolescents or adult. Um, we certainly know that there is a complex interaction between, you know, genetic predisposition, but also sort of your um, social situation. So we know that there's definitely social drivers of substance use, biological drivers of substance use, and it's really complicated and hard to tell. But I think that the mistake that we often make is waiting for someone to have all of those negative consequences um, before we are willing to talk about it. And so I, what I'm hoping we take from this is we don't know who's gonna go on um, to develop a, a lifelong chronic substance use disorder, but we really don't have time to wait, particularly because 
a lot of times what we'll see is people can overdose and die before we ever get to that point of saying, hey, there's a problem. And so if the first sign is an overdose, we've kind of missed the window. So I think because we worry, um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but because we're afraid of substance use and because we're afraid of talking about it, we don't want to say, hey, this substance use could be a problem, right? Because we're afraid of putting that label on someone because we think it's negative. But if you switched it and said, hey, you could be at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Um, I'm not afraid to say, hey, you could be at risk for diabetes. We need to monitor you. We need to check in some things. We need to adjust your diet. We need to change your exercise because this negative thing could happen. Um, we, we are with substance use. So I'm afraid to even talk about it. And because we are adding that sort of negative stigma on top of it, we miss an opportunity. And that missed opportunity can be like threatening. And so I'm hoping that, you know, how can we help? Number one is just to open that door to talk about it, to really normalize the conversation and destigmatize substance use, substance use disorders and treatment. Yeah, so a couple more things in the chat before we move on. Um, we have Severine commenting that um, labels can be negative because of insurance. Insurance agencies must change their way of looking at substance use disorder. We completely agree. We can also come back and do that webinar if you're interested. Um, so one more question that I think we're gonna get to, just wanna make sure it's on the radar is, um, Lakisha says, um, I'm probably jumping ahead, but what do you do when an adolescent presents with a parent the parent wants the adolescent to obtain treatment, but the adolescent does not. So I think we can address that when we get to um, the nuts okay. and bolts of treatment. Yep. But yep. So we'll make sure we we'll make sure we get that answer. Yep. yep. Consent and treatment really complicated. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about stigma. We're going to talk about reaching out, prevention, and treatments. And really, the key is just to say, "How can I help?" and to say. I'm no longer afraid to think, to say that there might be a problem. I'm gonna reach out and talk about it and open that door and make this not a scary stigmatizing conversation, but really just a, how can I help? Um, first, naloxone distribution. So naloxone is Narcan. This is the reversal agent for an opioid overdose. Um, this is a quote that just came out in CalMatters where I said colleges should make Narcan easily available, such as placing it in a bucket on the quad so students can walk by and grab it anonymously. I believe this because naloxone is life three, life saving. And if we cannot save a life, then we really, um, we've lost the war. And so I think that everyone should have access to naloxone. So question for all of you and just put a yes, no in the chat. Um, are any of you distributing naloxone? Are any of you have a pathway to pass out Narcan? Um, would love to know if you do, so please put it in the chat and also happy to talk through this offline if this is something you wanna do. Normalizing care. Um, so substance use disorder is a chronic illness. Um, and if we think about this as any other chronic illness, we expect periods of relapse and recovery. This is the same that happens a lot with asthma where people will um, have this chronic illness that they're able to live with, to manage, to have medications, to keep it under control. And like any chronic illness, um, some people are really great at following treatment plans. Some people struggle a little bit don't give up on anybody. Um, myself, I really struggle with treatment plans. Um, I'm really a terrible patient. And so I just have compassion for sort of the normal struggles that people have dealing with a chronic illness. And just to think about um, because someone does not perfectly adhere to a treatment plan, I think just to kind of take that compassion and say like, it can be hard um, and there's a lot of barriers to care. And so just kind of normalizing and thinking, you know, would I interact with, would I develop this care plan for any other illness? Like, would I treat someone with diabetes like this or someone with asthma um, and to really just normalize the conversation? Um, this is a quote from our Surgeon General that says, far too long people have thought about addiction as a character flaw and a moral failing. Addiction is a chronic disease. It's a brain disease 
And it is one that we can treat and we need to do that as we would any other chronic illness with skill, compassion, and urgency. And I agree hundred percent with that. So, so before, yeah, before we move on, let me just summarize what I'm seeing in the chat. looks like about half and half say they have um, the pathway to distribute naloxone. A little bit more yeses than noes. Um, we're going to talk about CA Bridge resources a little bit later, but specifically for those of you, I'm looking at um, Eric, who's saying the pharmacist is resistant to allowing us to distribute it, even though we have it. Um, just call us. We can get somebody on the phone with that pharmacist, and, and then you'll be able to distribute it. Pharmacists all often have... Um, some some uh, very well-founded but incorrect um, hesitations about letting that Narcan be let out onto campus and we can definitely provide you support there. Ashley, who's our amazing navigator at Watsonville Hospital is also saying she has an abundance of Narcan if anyone needs it. We're working on improved pathways to allow hospitals to be those community distribution sites for um, anyone in the community who wants them. And if you're curious, if you're out there thinking, well, I'm not sure that I would be able to get the buy-in or have the bandwidth to receive an entire naloxone distribution program at my school, um, we can let you know where in your community there might be a hospital where you could get just some to have on hand. So be in touch with us. Kudos to everybody out there. I know it's hard and it's um, a lot of work and a lot of like conversations and bringing people around, but I do think, you know, you're, you're saving lives. So um, kudos to everybody. Okay. So now we're going to get into this and hopefully there's more questions about this. And I answer some of them. What is different about treating youth? Um, we talked about, you know, why youth are so susceptible, kind of the brain differences that, um, underdeveloped frontal lobe with decisional challenges and kind of that inflated risk reward pathways. Um, so there is really interesting consent issues. So a minor um, can consent to medical care, counseling, conversations around diagnosis and treatment of substance use for drug and alcohol. However, they cannot consent on their own to take medicine. So um, any minor can receive, you all probably know this care in terms of like behavioral therapy, conversations, counseling, but they can't take medications without a parental consent unless they're otherwise emancipated in terms of consent for medication. So there's a split between counseling and actually taking medicine in terms of what a minor can consent for. Um, and then in terms of talking to adolescents, so if a parent, a parent wants a minor to take medications, but they're past the age of assent, they actually cannot force them to, to take medications. Um, so whereas the minor can't consent for medications, they do have to assent for treatment. So they have to agree to it. Um, and so a lot of what this is, is thinking about each individual, where they are in their development stage, what their cultural and healthcare beliefs are and their prior experiences, and trying to find a space where you can continue to move forward as a team. So you're kind of balancing the minor's independence, the parental involvement, and to kind of find a spot where they are. And what that can look like um, in terms of, you know, the family wants someone into treatment, but the adolescent does not, you can sometimes find a piece of treatment where you can agree to move forward. So maybe in, in one case, it's counseling. Maybe they're willing to go to counseling once or twice. Maybe they are completely uninterested in counseling, do not want to have anything to do with it, but would take, um, I have had an adolescent who is willing to take buprenorphine because it helps them to not feel sick, to, um, to say like, hey, you know that feeling that you get when you withdraw where you feel sick, this will help you feel normal. And so it's kind of just that one step of, okay, how can I find a space where we can problem solve together? Um, and to not say it's either everything or nothing, but to say like, where can we work together to kind of continue to move forward? Um, mostly what I try to do, particularly for adolescents, is to think what I want is for them to feel like um, healthcare and the healthcare system is a safe space. 
And I want them to, when they need help, I want to be able to increase that help seeking behavior. And so it's always like, Hey, this is the place I can go for help, not a place where I receive harm. Um, and so I always try to make sure that I am balancing their autonomy and their wishes so that they feel like this is a safe space where they can access help because we don't want to decrease help seeking behavior later. And please interrupt me if there's questions. So also language is important. Um, often we run into this tension between the language that the, you know, that adolescents and people are using. Um, they might use negative terms like alcohol, junkie, druggy, addict. Um, but as a, as a um, provider, I don't. I try to be, to use person first language. So it is someone who uses drugs or someone, a person with a substance use disorder, it is not a druggie because the diagnosis is not the person, um, that it is the person who is working through a condition, but first and foremost, they are a human being and a person. And so we kind of respect who they are in their journey um, and try to work with them and to not say like, hey, you are a dirty drug addict and this is sort of hopeless for you because once you've ended up in this space. Um, and so whereas people will use those languages about themselves, I don't. I try to, to let them know like, this is how I am thinking about it because I still respect you as a person. So always try to stick with person first language. So this is stuff that you guys know, right? This is a, a talk that I really have to talk to my colleagues about is how to talk to adolescents because they're really interesting and fun humans. Um, and we often struggle to interview um, adolescents. And so I thought about even like just pulling this out because you guys know this, but what I wanna say here is do what you know. You already know how to work with adolescents, how to encourage them, how to balance um, where they are in their developmental stage um, and to kind of understand like what works for them. And because you know that, just to take those skills that you already have and bring them to this space. Um, this, is, this is just the same as what you already know, which is kind of to making sure that they feel included. A lot of my colleagues will, um, talk down to adolescents, talk only to the parents, um, but to really kind of bring them into the conversation to recognize that there's really that balance of um, independence and autonomy during adolescence um, and to just really involve them, understand where they are and how we can make treatment work for them. So um, this is stuff that you guys know and could probably teach better than I could, um, but just to, to recognize like you're an expert here and talking about substance use disorders and talking about drug use is exactly the same as everything else that you do. Um, and just to kind of pull away the stigma and to say, you're really good at it. So here are the different, I'll pause here before we talk about different treatment options in depth and see if there's any questions. Cruise in the lab. Okay. Any coming through. Yeah. Cognitive behavioral therapy is probably what we're most familiar with. Um, it's frequently used for adolescents, young adults, very effective for anxiety. Um, it really focuses on alternative coping mechanisms. Um, and it has shown decent efficacy in terms of adolescent use with alcohol and marijuana, but has been less effective for adolescents with opioid use disorder. Um, and so just to kind of know, this is often what we use. We're often very familiar with it, but um, in terms of opioid use, I think because there's so much physiologic dependence, it tends to be less effective for adolescents. Um, so opioid use disorder, this is partially why we tend to focus on MAT, which is medication assisted treatment. And what we'll see from this pattern is you often start with this period of experimentation where you get really the euphoria and then the withdrawal and the euphoria and the withdrawal and you'll come back down to normal. But as you continue to use, what happens is tolerance and physical dependence develop. Um, and so what people do is they have to use just to feel normal and that they end up more in that withdrawal space. 
And so when you're in that withdrawal space, what people often do is they need to use just to feel normal. And so a lot of times that's where kind of the experimentation and recreational use can cycle into the cycle of tolerance and physical dependence. And what medications do, particularly one that we often use is buprenorphine, is it smooths out that cycle and so that people can feel normal. It is really hard um, particularly for adolescents who are struggling with that underdeveloped frontal lobe to be in a space when you come participate in some of the behavioral therapies, if you are caught in that cycle of withdrawal, um, because if you are caught into that cycle of withdrawal where you feel physically sick um, when you are withdrawing from the medication, it is really hard to then work through a behavioral health care plan. So a lot of times it just helps that individual feel normal so that they're better able to engage in treatment and some of the life skills coaching that will help them enter into long-term recovery. Um, and so this is what MAT, which is Medicaid Assisted Treatment, usually buprenorphine or methadone. Uh, most frequently for our population, it's going to be buprenorphine. It prevents withdrawal. It controls the craving and it really increases someone's ability to engage in treatment and to comply with some of the other, you know, life skills and behavioral therapies. And at the end of the day, it saves lives. Um, and that we see people who are taking medications have a longer, have um, decreased mortality. So really this is the, this is the summary for me is because it saves lives. And so really kind of as we think about like the challenges is really dealing with a chronic illness. Um, and because of the developmental stage for adolescents, all chronic illnesses are hard to manage. Um, diabetes, asthma, obesity, depression, anxiety, it's a tough time because there's kind of that tension between um, independence on top of the underdeveloped frontal lobe. I mean, they're really fun people, but Chronic illness is tough to manage in, in adolescents. And so that is also true of substance use disorders, which we think of as a chronic illness. And so this is, you know, the elephant in the room, which is stigma. And so if we think about substance use as any other challenge um, or a chronic illness or a risk factor for, you know, formative development, and just use our regular skills to reach out and to help um, we, we can open those doors. And so to kind of like address the elephant in the room, don't be afraid to talk about it and to normalize the conversation around substance use and to normalize conversations around treatment. Um, and so I'm gonna pause here for questions and then talk about what we're working on with California Bridge, which is rapid access to treatment. So Amy, I think James has been in other presentations you've made because he's saying, I've heard that the number needed to treat to save a life with Matt is two. Um, we actually have a slide about that in another deck. So Amy, do you wanna to speak to that? The difference between um, you know aspirin, warfarin, steroids, defib, and then bup? Yes. Um, so as you know, in healthcare, we talk about like, what is the number needed to treat? So how many people do I need to treat to save a life? And the number needed to treat, so the number of people that we need to treat with buprenorphine to get someone into treatment is two versus something that we all talk about is like, how many of you know you should take aspirin if you have a heart attack? Um, that's really common knowledge out there, but actually I have to treat eight people with aspirin in order to have a difference in someone who's taking a heart, someone whose life who has a heart attack. Um, whereas someone with an opioid use disorder, it's only two. And so it's highly effective medication. Um, and so really that's the key here is to just sort of destigmatize treatment and to say, Hey, it works. So thank you. So as, um, so Amy, do you want to go on to the next slide? So over at California Bridge, we are working left, right, and sideways to improve access to medication for addiction treatment within hospitals. And we began in 2018, 2019 with a pilot program of fi about 50 hospitals 
that were in the beginning initiation of Matt from their emergency room. And the most common question we got to the program that I didn't have a lot of resources to answer was what do we do about young patients? So based on the number of times we got on that, we got that question, you know, we kind of said, well, we can have somebody get on the phone with you and coach you for this one case, but we really didn't have the resources. We couldn't find them. So when the youth opioid response released their second round of funding, we applied to do a pilot with four hospitals that were very committed to being access points for youth treatment. So we began that project in March of last year. So it's about halfway through an 18 month program period now. And it's focused on a number of different elements, um, engagement street and screening for youth. Uh, there's a focus on case management. We're um, significantly increasing the number of youth who are receiving MAT prescriptions at the hospital. And then we also have a psychosocial partner called Young People in Recovery who provide um, social support and life support skills for young people who are um, struggling with drug use. And I really encourage you, they're a fantastic organization to look up the Young People Recovery chapter in your area. There most likely is one, they're quite robust in California. And they're a really, really great place to know, particularly for those youth that might not be fully ready to embrace medication for addiction treatment or other more formal treatment. Like Amy said, youth are not always so amenable to treatment plans. Young people in recovery might say, okay, well, let's meet you where you're at. Come to our sober bowling party or whatever we're doing in the group. And maybe that would be a step toward being ready for change. So I actually had a story prepared that I heard from one of the hospitals. That was a really wonderful story about a youth being navigated. But I'm going to defer that story maybe to another time and have Ashley, who is the navigator working at Watsonville Hospital. She actually just supported a young person in the hospital yesterday and is able to tell us about it. So, Sierra, I'm hoping we can unmute Ashley de Herrera, Ashley with two E's. And Ashley is, um, oh, it's young people in recovery, Derek. I'll put it in the, in the chat. Ashley has a really interesting backstory with California Bridge. She was actually one of our founding navigators at a hospital called Hazel Hawkins in, um, in uh, the Central Coast. And he actually went to Watsonville Hospital when they became eligible to do this work. And I know she's been um, very, very impactful at that hospital, including beginning an naloxone distribution program for them. So I was happy to see her here today. And Ashley, tell us about uh, the person that you helped yesterday. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, cool. Um, so I got a referral yesterday. There was a 14-year-old who was in my AG. She had been experimenting with psychedelic mushrooms. Um, so I went in and engaged the patient. She was super sweet, um, super open. Um, and I was able to get to the bottom of her experimentation, which was that she was off her medication, she is actually diagnosed with schizophrenia and she had stopped taking her medication, which caused her to kind of spiral and begin using and experimenting and just making some pretty poor choices. So I engaged her um, and what I did was I helped her come up with a plan to address her parents so that way she felt heard and supported as well. And I also gave her, I also connected her to one of our partners, Salud. So myself and Salud are gonna to continue to monitor this patient, but we're also gonna extend support to the family because we think that there's a um, connection barrier within the family as a whole. So I partnered with Salud, we're gonna to continue to monitor the family and I actually got the patient to agree to um, abstain from experimental use until she can get her um, mental health medication and attempt to stabilize by herself. But I also encouraged her in the future, like if she felt alone, if she felt scared, if she wanted to possibly you know, use again, for her to reach out to me um, and her therapist so that way we can you know, prevent a potential overdose so she doesn't mix her medications and she can begin to stabilize again. Wow, I agree with the um, Isaiah in the chat saying what an amazing share. Ashley, there's about 17 pieces of that story I want to unpack, but one is to draw attention to this um, uh, 
co-occurring schizophrenia that this patient had per the question that we saw earlier about female patients and higher rates of intentional overdose we do know that a lot of these patients who are uh, misusing substances have co-occurring mental health challenges so that just makes it um, even more important that we are you know exactly doing exactly what Ashley said navigating them taking the full person into account Amy is there anything you want to say about that or about Ashley share and 14 years old wow what a vulnerable age to be able to seek and, and receive help yeah so I um just want to say you know as we have gone through this project I think we've really just kind of started to scratch the surface of the need out there and um it just sort of rings true that like there, there's a lot of people struggling um, quietly and we have not, and I, I will say this, we meaning me, because this is the healthcare system has not developed the infrastructure to successfully take care of adolescents. Um, and so I recognize that all of the resources that your um, group is seeing is, is not, it's hard to find treatments that they need um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't like start to try and begin, um, because I think we're just not set up to, to do the job that we need to do. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah. Well, Ashley, thank you again so much for that share. Um, Ashley, as, as many people have is learning that, um, when I see your name and I know you, I'm probably going to call on you to talk about your important work. So <laughs> thanks for being down to get called on. I'm going to quickly talk through the impact numbers that we have from this pilot, just so you can see the scope of what we're doing. And um, then we have a question from James as well that um, I want Amy to, to take when I finish this. Amy, the question is, why do we lump psychedelics in with other drugs? They don't have the same addiction potential. I imagine you have quite a bit to say about that. Um, so before we get to that question, um, just to show you quickly the impact the thing that I think is most important about these impact numbers is that they're only from four hospitals. And yes, they're from four hospitals that have made a significant investment in this in terms of both clinical time for a physician to advocate for this work, as well as for time for the navigator, people in roles such as Ashley. So over the first nine months of the program, we screened nearly 9,000 young patients from the emergency room. So that really just shows the power of having these navigators who are based in the emergency room, but also spread out within their community to make people um, just aware that the emergency room is a place that they can get help. Of those nearly 9,000 patients, around um, 450 actually did receive services from that uh, navigator in the um, way that Ashley's talking about, you know, ongoing support, understanding of treatment options, maybe um, better planning for medication adherence. We evaluated about 170 for MAT and 86 actually began courses of buprenorphine. And the interesting thing that we have seen in this data is that we have a clinical facing resource, which I can share in the chat. Oh, and Melissa, the age group, yeah, 12 to 24. That's what the... Um, per that data that we shared at the very beginning of the um, presentation about the adolescent brain not being developed until 26. That's where the state comes up with that definition for addictions. This is a state-directed um, state, state directed age bracket. Yeah, so um, is the, yeah, so the interesting thing about this pilot is that once we actually put together a resource for providers, which I'm happy to share in the chat because it might be of interest to some of you with the school-based health clinic, once providers actually had that we saw MAT prescriptions go up considerably. So that 86 number was actually doubled in just the last three months, which we were very happy about. So providers really just need to understand that this is safe and allowed and a good idea. And then it starts to happen. Um, so this is our resource page. We have this fancy QR code. If you wanna, you can literally just hold your phone up to the screen and it'll bring you to our resource page. You can also go to cabridge.org slash resources. Our naloxone toolkit is there, our provider facing materials about youth are there, our outreach materials are there. It's a really accessible resource page for anything you might need to know about MAT. Um, so we encourage you to use that when it might be appropriate. Um, Amy, do you wanna talk about the question about psychedelics? Um, so 
super complicated. There's starting to be some data that shows benefit in terms of use of psychedelics, particularly with PTSD um, for addiction. And I think the thing to know about our drugs, like pharmaceuticals, is there's benefits and risk with everything. And so there's always, you have to balance like, when is this medication helpful versus when is it not helpful? Um, because certainly like we know that there are harms associated with psychedelics, but there's potential for benefit. And so it's just a matter of like doing the research to find where is the balance and where is this particular drug helpful versus harmful. And so I think it's, I think it's, it's unclear and we don't necessarily know the right answer yet. Um, but certainly it's, it's an interesting area of study. Yeah. Um, and so Tracy is asking, does our organization have plans to expand our youth map pilot? Amy and I have lots of plans. <laughs> Amy and I have nothing but plans. Um, so yes, we're hoping, we're very much hoping that this is the beginning of a true culture shift in the way that youth are treated. Oh, we love our plans too. We just got uh, funders to love our plans. So we're yeah. working hard on that. Um, so a couple more questions, Amy. Um, uh, Severine is asking, is the data for Matt with teens available for the public? Severine, do you mean the data that I just showed um, about our impact or do you mean general, uh, the general, because uh, everything in this presentation was, um, you know, generally public available except for our impact numbers. So we I do, think we do plan to um, publish the youth pilot data because yep. you're correct. Um, I think that what we have shown with our pilot is that there's a need that it can be met in the hospital and that when we can form these partnerships, we can provide better access to youth and young people um, because we agree that it is underutilized. So I think we're um, hopefully going to publish the results of our pilots where we still have another couple months before we're done. So we're gonna keep climbing up our numbers and then hopefully put it out there. And Desiree is asking, um, what is the percentage of youth who voluntarily enroll in inpatient treatment? I don't know that we have a percentage. For we, that. Um, I don't think we haven't reviewed to see how many are in inpatient treatment, um, but generally the number of youth who want inpatient treatment is lower than the ones who are willing to engage in outpatient treatments um, because most of our youth really don't want to, it's a big disruption. I mean, it's, for adults too, it's a big disruption in your life. Um, and so a lot of them are much more open to outpatient treatment um, than inpatient treatment. So I think, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot more um, voluntary outpatient treatment, which is, is one of the benefits of being able to have like school-based health um, to be able to take care of people where they are. Yeah, and Amy Ranger, who I'm guessing is somebody with the School-Based Health Alliance, sorry, Amy, nice to meet you, is saying um, we can put together another training or work group about Narcan distribution. We can definitely staff that for you. Just let us know and we'll have um, our staff members who work on Narcan, Josh and Charles, put together something specific for school-based health clinics. That's definitely something we can, we can provide. Um, other questions? Ask us anything. We've got about five more minutes here. Just want to say thank you to everybody for participating. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you do because it's just so important. Yeah, I can share my basketball team story. If uh, the one that I had that I had under um, just in case we had time in addition to Ashley's. So we had a really great story come out out of our December data for our youth map pilot. Uh, this story is out of Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, which is one of our um, one of our pilot programs and also an early, actually an early place in California where MIT was offered. They've been doing it for a lot longer than other people. Ashley has a counterpart there named Araceli, who's the navigator at that hospital. So they had a 17 year old patient um, come to the hospital because she was using fentanyl and her boyfriend's sister had died of a fentanyl overdose. So yeah, Araceli's awesome, we love her. So the boyfriend's sister um, had died of the fentanyl overdose and the boyfriend and the patient just kind of said, all right, we gotta get help because the sister died and we don't wanna die. So 
they came to the emergency room and were started on buprenorphine in the emergency room. So they left the ED with a prescription for buprenorphine, but um, about a week later, they were uh, running out of it. The patient was running out of the prescriptions. So the navigator set up a telehealth appointment for the patient with the physician champion, but the patient was at her basketball team practice at high school and the practice went over time because they had like a big game the next day. It is basketball season after all, right? Go Warriors. Um, so the patient missed the appointment, just missed the telehealth appointment, did not make it. And, you know, we all have seen the way that these kind of soulless telemedicine systems where if you miss the appointment, the next appointment isn't for however long and you can't get anybody on the phone to help you. We all know how that can happen. So the beauty of the navigator is it really solves that problem. The navigator and the champion actually were able to call the patient's grandmother when she missed her appointment. And they ended up having a telemedicine visit at 8 p.m. after the practice ends and the patient got a prescription and a follow-up appointment at a clinic. So that sounds like a happy ending, right? Okay, you're all gonna know where this story is going. The patient got COVID and missed her appointment at the follow-up clinic because um, that's also the day that we're living in right now. It's basketball season and Omicron season. So um, the patient was unable to make the follow-up appointment, but is still in touch with the navigator to make sure that her treatment is uninterrupted. So we love that story because it really just shows the um, simple things that can get in the way of treating a youth patient and also the power of having that warm handoff navigator to do exactly what Ashley's talking about, which is just allow the patient to know that the resources will be there when they are ready and able to access them. Um, so Eric is asking thoughts about outreach and collaboration with local school districts. Yeah, so this is something that's happening as part of our pilot. It looks a little bit different in every place. Um, but generally, I think that what's been really successful is um, working with school principals and administrators to expand their thinking beyond there's a student using drugs, suspend them, toward there's a student using drugs, help, help them, support them. Amy, do you want to say more about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think at the, like, I love this question and that's exactly where we want to go. I think at the beginning of this, we wanted to just say like, hey, is this something that we can do? And is this something that people would be interested in? Um, and I think the answer was a resounding yes. There's a huge need out there and there's a, a way that we can really collaborate and um, do a better job of kind of creating a net around young people, which is at this moment in time, what they need more than anything is for us to, to kind of really come together to stretch and to create that good net. And I think, you know, certainly um, how we can do a better job of working with our local school districts, particularly everything that you guys are doing with school-based health um, I think is wonderful. And if we can think of ways, you know, as we push forward and keep doing this work to do it in a more systematic way, um, would love to participate because absolutely. Yeah. So I know Amy and I both have a time crunch at noon, but just to get to these final few questions, Lakisha, email me about Philadelphia. There actually is quite a lot of math happening in Philadelphia and I can get you to the right people to understand, um, Penn, Penn in particular, the Penn hospital, UPenn is, um, is very pioneering in this space. So I'm sure they'll be able to help you. Um, how can LACOE help assist with outreach or county offices in general? And do, yes, you'll have all the materials sent out by Sierra, is that right? So county offices in general, um, working with counties is a whole, a whole big piece of this. Amy, what do you wanna say about um, working with county departments of education? Um. Make sure they know. I think, yeah, I think we're, yeah, like, we're, yeah. at, the, we're at the education standpoint, but um, gosh, you guys are like totally right. There's so much opportunity yeah. um, for better collaboration to kind of build that net and to make sure that we are able to interview yeah. really and often. And um, we've been really successful with um, sending, we have, so we have consultants all over the state, people like Amy, who are um, very strategically all over the state. So like if the... Um, LA uh, Department of Education wanted an LA based physician to come in and present about the opportunities for expanding youth to mat um, just because people like to hear from you know people in their backyard that's definitely something we can um, set up so just reach out to us that's kind of what we do 